Okay. So first off, you know, one of the things that really stands out to me, Dan, is that, and is your last name? It says Daniel Raz on Twitter. Is that your, mm -hmm. is that your full last name? No, that's my middle name. My full name is Daniel Raz as well. All right. All right. Well, officially then. Nice to meet you. So you help men at 300 pounds get below 200 pounds without even having to go to the gym. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about this first. How do you do that? So a metaphor I like to use is Gordon Ramsay, the famous chef, mm -hmm. can make a better meal with one pan than the average person can with five pans. Because it's not about how much equipment you have. It's about knowing what to do. And it's the same thing with getting a great workout in. You can go to a gym and have a bunch of fancy machines. But if you don't know what you're doing, you won't get a great workout in. And if you just have your body and you know what you're doing, you can get a fantastic workout in. And I figured that the people who often need the most help are the most intimidated going to the gym. They don't like to go to the gym. So I like to propose an alternative solution. I like that. And so less is more approach, more about quality, less about quantity. Yeah. And so Dan, what brought you to this? What Did you have a transformation in your own life or what inspired this for you? So I'm sure you are aware that in 2020, there was a lockdown situation mm -hmm. thing going on. Yeah. So all of a sudden... That was no longer a possibility. And fortunately for me, that was after a decade of me being interested into health and fitness. So I already had the knowledge. And all of a sudden, I couldn't go to the gym, even though I did that pretty frequently. But because I had the knowledge, I knew what to do. And I was still able to get just as good results. So that mostly made me believe that it was possible. And I wanted to become an online fitness trainer and looking at others, pretty much everyone says, I will help you lose weight in less time while sit, still eating the food you love. Like it's something along that sentence, mm -hmm. it's almost identical, right? But I've never heard anybody be in my quote unquote niche. I feel like I personally haven't heard anybody say that they help men that are 300 pounds get below 200 pounds without going to the gym. That's a more unique sentence. So I feel like that makes me more unique. Yeah. And so what is what are some of your fundamental philosophies around your approaches and how do they differ from the traditional mainstream approaches that seem to fail people? Well, my approach is more about sustainability and what results will get you in a year and 10 years. Because you can do literally anything to lose 20 pounds. Literally open any magazine, follow any workout, you lose 20 pounds. But what happens after those 90 days where you lose those 90 pounds? What have, after those 90 days where you lose those 20 pounds? What happens then? Right? Because you can see a before and after picture, but what happens after that? That's not what most people show you. And that's what I want to tackle and address. Because I believe... Compared to losing 20 pounds, losing 100 pounds isn't five times more difficult. It's 1,000 times more difficult because it's, as I mentioned, you can follow any diet and lose 20 pounds, but to lose 100 pounds, you're going to have to stick with it for at least a year, meaning it has to be sustainable by the definition, right? So that's the approach I like. So there's no like name for the diet I follow. Mm -hmm. There's no name for the work that I follow because it's all specific to the individual. Yeah. So this is more about maybe incorporating a lifestyle change, right? And reprogramming exactly. habits and behaviors and attitudes that you have even around food, maybe? 100%. And I actually mentioned this to one of my clients recently. I believe, you know, the show Love is Blind, mm -hmm. where I think it's one of those shows where a guy and a girl are in separate rooms and there's a wall in between so you can't see what they look like and they just talk and if they vibe with each other then they meet each other. I believe that if there was a wall and I couldn't see the other person, just from asking basic questions, I can see how fit they are, how healthy they are, just by the way they think about 
food and nutrition and exercise. And because of that, kind of changing the mindset and the viewpoint will enable people to sustainably lose the weight. Yeah, that sounds like a really good approach. What do you find that most people struggle with in the initial um in the initial coaching plan when they are working with you? What's one of the hardest things for people to break? Most people, I believe, that are unfit or overweight think of healthy eating and working out as a binary, as either yes or no. Well, people that are more fit think of it as a continuum. It's not, did they walk out or did I not walk out, but how much did I walk out? It's not, did I eat healthy or did I not eat healthy? It's to what degree did I eat healthy? So I like to start with easy wins, things that you can do that don't take a lot of time, don't take a lot of effort, and will still move the needle in the right direction. So right now it's January. Everyone is only eating lettuce and lean chicken and spending three hours at the gym and drinking seven bottles of water. Everyone is doing that right now. Mm -hmm. That's super difficult to maintain. So in three weeks, you probably throw it all away because that's way too much. But I believe if I get people what I call the easy wins, things that don't take a lot of time, don't take a lot of effort, and they can do every day, then they'll get momentum. They'll see themselves losing three, four, five, six, ten 10 pounds. And then they're like, okay, Daniel, what else you got? And then I give them things that require a bit more effort and get the more results. So it's almost like, and I noticed this during January too, Do when we set new goals to lose weight or to eat less or to change our habits, we actually like overfill our plate anyway. 100%. And then we're like, oh, oh, you know, this isn't working and this is too much. We almost set up these unrealistic expectations for ourselves rather than stepping into something, maybe tiptoeing into things and gradually seeing slow changes manifest into long-term new positive habits, right? Exactly. Because if you look at most of my clients doing um, the first month, they might lose 10 pounds, which is nothing impressive. But then during the second month, they always lo lose 10 pounds. And during the third month, they again lose 10 pounds. So after a year, that's super impressive. But if, after a month, it's not impressive. So I am just going for a different demographic and a different approach, right? That's why almost none of my before and after are within a month. Because it's not that impressive. But after a year, you're like, okay, whole different person. And the great thing is anybody can do it. You just have to go about it more strategically to not go all out to begin with. And so what are some of the first like tiptoeings into these approaches? Do you, do you set a typical person up with? Definitely. So an uh, example of an easy way and thing that doesn't take a lot of time or effort is having a water bottle within arm's reach. It doesn't take time, it doesn't take effort. If you do that, you will be obviously more hydrated, which will cause you to not be as hungry throughout the day and have more energy, things of that nature. Another example is I can't snap my fingers and make it so that there's 25 or 26 hours in the day allowing you to sleep for an extra hour or two. But if I give you a few tips to improve the quality of your sleep, then you don't just spend any time, any more effort. You just have higher quality of sleep and that will allow you again to have more energy, be able to bone fat and build muscle easier because the quality is higher. So different things like that, basically. Yeah. Do you find that if we are not getting the right amount of sleep, that can impact whether or not we lose weight or we can stick to a plan? 100%. People with either not enough sleep or poor sleep quality are way more likely to not just be more agitated, but also crave junk food in general, just crave more food in general. And when you're in a bad mood and you have low energy, you're like, okay, I need to get more food inside of me to so have more energy. And especially when you're feeling irritated, you're more likely to go for the junk food. Yeah, because when you're activated, you're like not really wanting to do a whole lot of thinking. So it's just like yeah. satiate this Whatever's need. Whatever's convenient. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So what about, do you ever implement any type of fasting at all? Mm -hmm. So 
for everything I say, my diet approach is like a your diet, whatever works best for your schedule. Mm -hmm. But fasting can definitely be beneficial. And the way I recommend people do fasting is to sleep, pick a pick a day ahead of time. Because if you plan it ahead of time, it makes it easier to stick with it. And try to sleep an extra hour or two during that day. Because that, firstly, makes it so there's less hours in the day to eat. Mm -hmm. But also, as I mentioned, the more you sleep, especially if you get high quality sleep, then you won't just feel as hungry in general throughout the day. And possibly the most important tip is to keep busy and make sure you have a lot of things going on. So because you're not going to spend any time cooking, digesting, or eating the food, you're going to have more time on your hands. So that, that should be the day where you go to your bank or do some errands and get things done. And you can make that a super productive day. And if you're always busy, then you won't even think about food. I'm guessing all of us have been in a situation where we were hungry, but there was a task that had to get done immediately and we couldn't lay our eyes off it. We had to focus on it. And after three hours, we weren't as hungry because we're so focused on the task. Yeah. So if you can be intentional about that, then you can make fasting a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, totally. I've been in situations like that where all of a sudden you realize that you do it. And I've implemented fasting from time to time as well. Um, but it, you're absolutely right. I think, and do you find this too, that we just tend to eat when we're bored? I remember growing 100%. up, my mom would be like, you're not hungry. You're just bored. Go do something. Yep. And then I find myself saying the same thing to my kids. Like, you're not hungry. It's only been two hours. You're fine. You had protein. You should be good. You know, like. <laughs> yep. No, that's definitely extremely true. Sorry about that. And so oh, when, no. so do you have a preference of food style? Do you, do you um, encourage vegan diets at all for people? Do you have a go-to of what your fundamental macros are that you want to make sure you're encouraging people to eat? Or do you stay very individualistic to the the person's already curated regimen? Right. I would say it's definitely more on the individual's curated regimen side because I believe if you can't stick with something for a decade, there's no point in doing it for a day. Right. It's about sustainability. Because again, you can follow any diet and lose those initial pounds, but in a year from now, how do you look? How do you feel? That's what matters most. So the way I go about this is I see what my clients already enjoy eating. And then I suggest from what you enjoy eating, try to eat a bit more of this and maybe a bit less of that. But I would never go the extreme approach of saying you have to eat this and you can't eat that. So there's nothing that's completely off limits. Nothing is completely restricted. And there's nothing that you're going to have to force yourself to eat, right? It's about eating more healthy, tasty foods. And what I also recommend, which for some reason isn't really talked about, is to try new foods to expand your taste buds. Mm -hmm. Because I believe dieting is about increasing how much food you eat, not de decreasing, not diminishing. Because I bet there's a bunch of healthy, tasty foods out there that you have never tried, that you don't know is tasty because you've never tried it. So trying new foods is the key to expanding your taste buds and having more options of healthy foods that you enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. And do you think that when we create too much of a habitual pattern around the foods that we eat, can that at all become an obstacle to our our continuing progress and efforts towards losing weight? You know what I mean? I've I've read some stuff that if you have the same boring, consistent type of diet, that it can actually be a blockade to the progress do you want that you want to make. Have you ever seen anything like that or seen that in your own experience yes many times people eat things not because they particularly like it not because it's particularly healthy just because they're used to it it's what they've always done yeah. Yeah. and switching it up to something that they may enjoy even more something that may be even healthier that may take just as much time or even less time to prepare could be super beneficial but the only reason why they haven't done it is because they're so used to the old habits of what they used to be eating. So simply making a small suggestion, be like, hey, this has more protein, less calories. 
I think you'll find it, it tastes better, let me know. And it takes even less time to prepare or cook. Try it out. Sometimes it's a yes, sometimes it's a no. And if it's a yes, fantastic. If it's a no, cool. Here's another option. And if you keep doing that, then eventually you'll get to the point when it's a lot easier to get the body that you want. Because the people that are healthier and fitter often aren't using way more willpower, often aren't a lot more ambitious than you are. They simply have more systems in the place to make it easy to make the healthy choice and difficult to make the unhealthy choice. Yeah. Yeah. Like, especially when you get into more of the celebrity fitness people, they have people who are preparing everything for them and reminding them of all of that stuff. And whereas the majority of us are kind of fending for ourselves and having to discern through all the different information that's available out there and then having to know, is this going to work for me? And of course, then if I don't see results immediately, we often go into that downward spiral of it's just not going to work out and I give up anyway. And how often does that happen in your program? I mean, the reason why that doesn't happen is because I am there to hold them accountable and to make sure that I show them the path and let them know, be like, hey, this happens, there's a plateau. After two weeks, it will go down. And if they didn't have that, then they might binge. Or if they're in a plateau for two weeks, be like, hey, make this change, make this small adjustment, and then they're able to go down again. So often the difference between being stuck and the difference between why my clients are in a plateau for max a few weeks to some people have experienced the plateau for a decade is because they don't have a coach. They don't have anybody there to make adjustment. Mm -hmm. So even one conversation, one small adjustment can be the difference between being stuck for a decade and being stuck for a week. Yeah. I think that just goes into the mindset, especially in America of like, I have to do it myself. And if I can't figure out how to do it, then maybe I shouldn't do it or I'm a failure. And maybe there's this I think there is this, you know, uh, back burner fear that if I ask for help or if I ask for someone else to guide me and encourage me, that's just a sign of my weakness. But really, if you're asking someone else for help, that kind of shows a little bit of will and motivation that you recognize there's an issue and I need help so that I can find the remedy to it, right? 100%. Because... If you try to do everything on your own, you'll just waste a bunch of time and waste a bunch of money because you can give your 16-year-old kid, hey, watch these YouTube videos and learn how to drive. And if you never hire a driving instructor, the consequences are extremely more severe than hiring a driving instructor because you might save, you know, $100 per lesson by not hiring a driving instructor, but if you don't have that, then your kid will probably crash the, uh, crash the car yeah. or might run someone over or might have really dire consequences. So the consequences of not investing in yourself, not having a coach are way worse than whatever investment it is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think I've seen you tweet about this too. And a lot of how we take care of our bodies and how we eat and our overall physical health that has can have devastating effects in the bedroom too, if we're not careful. Right. And so this, this approach and this lifestyle change that you help coach individuals on, this is kind of a multidimensional encouragement and lifestyle change, right? Like the better you eat, the more qualitative sex you can have essentially. Right. 100%. Looking better is just the very first thing that people notice, but literally everything, because if you're super competent at playing piano, unless there's a piano in front of you, you can't show off that skill. Mm -hmm. If you're you're extremely bad at playing piano, nobody's going to know unless there's a piano in front of you. But you carry your body with you everywhere you go at all times, 24-7, you carry your body with you. And it affects at literally everything that you do. Right, And it's not just about how you look, it's about how you perform in literally everything, in every aspect. Yeah, yeah. And and it's difficult to even confront, come to terms with that too, with the different narratives about, you know, the, in the different messages about bodies and how we receive bodies and how we perceive bodies and how we shame people. And 
do you find that a lot of people might prolong their their desires to actually want to get in shape because they've had all of this shame and insecurity and all these social narratives basically telling them that that's just who they are and then struggling between do I do anything about it or is this supposed to be I'm supposed to love myself the way that I am do you find that that's ever kind of like that impetus that has has prolonged people from making changes before does that make sense definitely there's a lot of things no, definitely. There's a lot of things holding people back from making a change. And the reality is, it's always going to be nerve-wracking or scary once you do anything different. Mm-hmm. And there's always a million reasons to stay the same. But if nothing changes, nothing changes. And people tend to forget that the biggest risk of all is often not doing anything. Mm-hmm. Because if you keep looking how you look, feeling how you feel, how is your quality of life going to be, right? How is you not changing, affecting not just you, but your family, your spouse, as you mentioned in all areas, even your kids, your grandkids, how long you live. Yeah. So, yeah, there's definitely so many reasons why people don't make a change. And a lot of people just don't believe it's possible for them, right? Which is why I think starting with the easy wins so people see themselves getting tangible results week after week after week after week, they wouldn't want to stop. If you do anything extreme, then they can't sustain it. And that causes them to just feel worse about themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And and so then what along the lines in your philosophy, how do you redirect people to really make time for implementing these changes, because I'm, you know, this is something I often hear as a coach too, is I don't have time and I didn't have time and I ran out of time. What's kind of your redirecting affirmation to help encourage people how to like make that time? Right. So that's a really good question. And everybody says that you can always make time. You can always find a way, but I like to be a lot more practical with it and actually have them implement things that literally take no time and still move the needle in the direction. And then once they see tangible results, then they ask, okay, Daniel, what else do you have? And then they're more willing to spend 10, 20, 30 minutes. So a few quick things, as I mentioned, you can always drink water, it doesn't take time. Right now we're having a conversation. I don't know if you can tell, but this is a standing desk. I'm standing right now. Every time I do a Zoom call, every time I talk, every time I talk on the phone, I'm either standing or walking at all times because I'm going to be talking anyways, might as well move, right? And um, just like we said before, improving the quality of your sleep, it doesn't take time, but you still get more bang for your buck, right? And also, I like to encourage my clients to have a lot of what I call meal prep food. When people think of meal prep, they think about broccoli, rice, and chicken in a glass container. But by my definition, meal prep food is anything that takes less than five or 10 minutes to prepare that you can eat. So eggs, beans, bananas, right? Thin slices of steak or chicken, as an example. Anything that's very quick, right? You can always have that. Or if you are eating out, you can always have healthier options. So wherever you go, doesn't matter if it's a whatever, chipotle, for example, you can always get double meat. You can always have a bowl instead of the burrito or the tortilla, and you can always have less sauce, and you can always pick water instead of whatever soft drink. That small change doesn't take any extra time, and there's fast food places everywhere, and you can always order double meat, lots of veggies, water. That's always an option. Yeah, yeah. And and do you strongly, you encourage people to move away from all the carbonated stuff and yeah. and all of that, right? Like water is super important. And I'm sh- sure you know this, we are a dehydrated society and it's 100%. so weird how people are so aversive to water. I got, I got really hooked on water. I'd say in my mid twenties, I was watching my um, in-laws at the time, you know, they just always did this water routine at night. And I was like, what is this? And they were like, water's good for you. You should drink water. And I'd never heard anyone say it like that before. And I just started this routine. And honestly, 
between that and coffee and tea, that's all I really drink and tequila, but you know, <laughs> not very regularly. Um, but it's such a strange aversion people have. I've heard people say like, I hate the taste of water. I'm like, well, it doesn't, really, it doesn't taste like anything. And so what yeah. do you, what do you think impacts these people to not think about water that way? I think, as you mentioned, just not really being told. So that's why I say to either have a water bottle within arm's reach at all times. That makes yeah. it easier. So then you don't have to think about it. It's just right there. Or the second thing I recommend is having three water bottles in the three locations you spend the most time in. So maybe that's the living room, your office, and the car. If you have three different water bottles, you will never find yourself in a position where you can't drink water. Because some people forget and they're like, oh, the water bottle is 30 seconds that way. I don't want to get up. But if it's right next to you, if it's not more convenient for you to do the right thing, then you're way more likely to do the right thing. So that's the entire approach if I was to summarize it in a sentence. Make it easy to do the right thing that yeah. is beneficial for you and make it difficult to do the wrong thing that's going to harm you. For me, as an example, if I want to eat ice cream, I can just walk to my fridge. It's not there. Yeah. I'd have to get in my car. I'd have to drive to the nearest grocery store. I'd have to find where the ice cream is, talk to the cashier, buy it, come back home, open it, find a spoon. It's a process. It might be a 20-minute process, but it's still a process. And if I want to eat blueberries, as an example, or Greek yogurt, I can just walk 10 seconds that way. And that's yeah. it. Yeah. That, that is, that is a difficult challenge for the self though, too, right? Like I think about that. Sometimes I notice we get into habit of buying more unhealthy foods, you know, probably because we know we've got a busy week coming up. We're trying to keep it convenient. And I I'm like, well, if I keep buying the stuff, I'm still endorsing it. I have to stop buying it. And so it's really about changing your shopping habits too, right? 100%. I say that the place that determines your fat levels more than anything isn't the gym, isn't the kitchen, it's the grocery store. What you do in the grocery store determines how successful you will be. So what I recommend is to make a list when you're in a rational state because we all heard the golden rule of never go grocery shopping when you're hungry because you'll make irrational choices. So the key is to write a list of what you will get and stick to the list you made. And in general, in almost all grocery stores, all the healthy foods are in the outside aisles. And in the middle is where all the junk is. So try to avoid going to the middle aisles unless you have to pick something specific and then just go there with your head down, take that one specific item, put it in the basket, and then continue forward. And then for the rest, try to get in and out as quickly as possible. Because grocery stores actually play slow music if you ever listen to it. So you're more relaxed and you're more likely to spend more time there and be like, actually, uh, let me get this as well. And let me get that as well. So Ooh, you spend more money. You want you to know, avoid you that. You bringing that up. I think, you know, we go to Walmart to get some of our groceries. And I'm like, every time I'm there, I'm like, they're always playing really good music. And it makes you feel happy. And now that I'm thinking yeah. about it, like, hmm. Yeah, it could be influencing us subtly to, oh, I feel good. I'm in a happy mood. Let's spend more money. Let's get the stuff I don't need. Yeah. Yep. I, re I remember learning about that several years ago, this whole grocery store setup. If you look at a grocery store and see the way it's set up, and I was like, mm -hmm. I never realized that before. And so we created a rule where we're like, we'll spend the most amount of time in the produce and the meat. We'll hit the dairy section for our butter and milk and cream, but get out, right? Like avoid the processed food. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. And I, I think that those are hard to avoid too, right? Like unless you, do you encourage um, your clients to get comfortable with reading labels too? Mm -hmm. Right. And initially, my clients can simply take a picture of what they're eating if they don't want to spend more than one minute seeing exactly what it is, right? Because obviously, again, sometimes you don't have time to decipher exactly every little small thing. But if the benefit of doing some sort of tracking and looking at nutrition labels is, again, it opens your mind up 
and close the gap between what you think you eat and what you actually eat. And you'll discover many foods that are high in protein and low in calories that you actually enjoy and many foods that have way more calories than you realized. So that's the benefits of tracking because it allows you to have a more accurate perception of reality. Yeah. And those higher calories, those are sometimes often just empty calories, right? That just sit there and don't do anything. And they're not filling either. Yeah. Yeah. And you, yeah, exactly. You don't feel full. You just feel hungry and hungry and hungry and it, it activates. And, and isn't it true too, that most of these foods that are processed, they all contain sugar and sugar activates the dopamine sensors and you just want to keep hitting it all day. I noticed that if I give my, if I let my kids have like chocolate or if I make cookies, right. If they've had sugar, they just, they just keep wanting it. And I'm like, uh, have you had any carrots today? Hey, do you have any protein yet today? You know, and let's move towards some denser fulfilling calories. Do your kids love chocolate? Oh, we all love chocolate. Love it. Love you want it. to hear a hack? Okay. I absolutely love chocolate as well. So what I did was I started with 70% dark chocolate, mm. which most people can handle. It is a bit bitter, but most people can handle. Eat that for two or three weeks. Next week, 75%. Eat that for two or three weeks. Next week, 80%. Uh, or oh, three weeks after that, 80%. Every two or three weeks, bump it up by 5%. Now, I generally enjoy 100% cacao dark chocolate, which is considered a superfood by pretty much every metric. You know, now, it's... It's interesting. We we do eat 70% right now. That's what I've moved us towards. Like I kind of avoid milk chocolate and semi-sweet and nice. I and I buy the bougie chocolate, the real chocolate. And actually yeah. they do eat it less now. Cause I'll I'll give them I make them a cup of hot cocoa at night. I had heard that if you have dark chocolate, it can help um boost your magnesium levels, which helps activate your melatonin so that you'll yep. fall asleep faster and have yep. more deeper sleep. And so we've been doing hot cocoa at night and they are, they're going to sleep faster and they don't crave as much sugar than either or chocolate. So anyway, sorry to interrupt there. A hundred percent. Yeah. And that's exactly the point because if you probably give them a hundred percent cacao right now, they'll be like, oh, this is awful. This is disgusting. But if you ease up into it pretty soon, now, if I eat 90% chocolate, it tastes like a Mars bar to me. It tastes like, it tastes like any dessert because yeah. relatively it's so sweet because I'm so used to it. But if you keep increasing it, in my opinion, once you go above 90%, it's more healthy than unhealthy. There's way more benefits than whatever sugar they were able to sneak into it. So if you're able to constantly eat 195, even 90%, then you don't have to really limit yourself oh, in terms nice. of how much chocolate you eat. So you're getting all the the pro benefits of it and very rare of that and very little of the negative consequences of it. I love it. Okay, well, that's good. I feel good about that. So they can keep eating that. Good, good. Yeah. And so really that, and even doing that, like slowly weaning yourself off of sugar and processed foods is really a struggle for a lot of people, isn't it? 100%. And- Again, the entire approach is not to go cold turkey yeah. because that's difficult. Yeah. That's too much effort. But if you slowly ease into it, be like, your task is to eat chocolate. Okay, you can do it. And slightly more bitter, slightly less sweet. Be like, yeah, but still chocolate. And then you yeah. slowly increase it. And you don't even notice that you're changing your taste buds. And that can apply to everything. Another thing I encourage people to do is, as I mentioned, to try new healthy foods, right? Because sometimes... For example, the first time I tried Brussels sprouts, I liked it. I didn't know it, right? And if I never tried it, I didn't know that I would enjoy it. Obviously, there's some foods that I tasted that kombucha, for example, think it's awful, could never get used to it. (laughs) And that's fine. You don't have to try it. You don't have to enjoy everything. But another example is onions for me. At first, onions, it's something that I knew were healthy in terms of benefits, but I didn't like the taste. But it wasn't so bad. It wasn't so disgusting like kombucha that I'm like, this is, I would never eat it. But it wasn't something that I loved. But if 
onions happen to be on a sandwich or in soup or next to my chicken, I would eat it. And I slowly started getting used to more and more onions. And now I generally love them. And it turns into a new healthy and tasty food. So if you eat foods that are healthy, but maybe not so tasty, not disgusting, but healthy, but not so tasty, keep eating them. Eventually they will become healthy and tasty. And again, the purpose is to expand your options of healthy and tasty foods. That way there's so many healthy and tasty foods you enjoy, you never have to limit yourself and you can look forward to eating the foods that get you results. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that is I've always encouraged my children to have an open palate, right? Like I always wanted them to be able to try new foods and to handle spicy foods too. But what's interesting is if I can build a story around a new food I'm introducing to them. I tell them what part of their body it benefits. You know, I'll be like, this is good for your eyes or this is good for, for your liver. Or, you know, this is good for your brain fat or whatever it is. If I can build a story around it and then, you know, remind them of that story every time I introduce it again, they get to a place where they look forward to it, right? Like my kids were eating sushi at like five years old. They love wasabi, right? They love experimenting with flavors. They love when we mix stuff. And I, for for them, I've always found it's just about incorporating a story around it that affirms, you know, kind of the lifestyle you want to create around it. And so if telling yourself it's really healthy for me, it's going to make my hair shinier, or it's going to strengthen my bones, that can be one approach to just creating a new affirmation around food that maybe you once heard was gross and so you avoided it. Yeah, no, that's a great tip for sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, so with all that you do, what is it that you really want to be the great takeaway through coaching your clients. So what is what is your hope for when someone's introduced to your coaching plan? That there is obviously more than one way to succeed and sustainably lose the weight. And it's definitely possible. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what your past is, what you've tried in the past. You can always make a change. So... Never think it's impossible for you. And probably the biggest takeaway I want people to take out of life in general is invest in the greatest asset that there is, which is yourself. Crypto, stocks, real estate might go down, might go up, depending on the economy. But your body will always be there for the rest of your life, literally. So make sure you invest in yourself accordingly. I love that. And so, Dan, how can people invest in their bodies and also have you encouraging and coaching them? What's the best way to track you down? Do you have a website where people can find you? Yes. So my website is danielrazfit.com. So that's D-A-N-I-L-R-A-Z-F-I-T.com. I am most active on Twitter or X, danielraz underscore fit. And I used to post on Instagram or Facebook, but I don't like those platforms anymore. <laughs> so I'm doubling down on X. So if you have an account, follow me on there and message me. We'll talk, see if us working together makes sense. And even if not, I'll make sure to point you in the right direction. That's awesome. And I will also include your website and your your Twitter handle on the show notes during the publication so people can click on that to find you as well. I really appreciate you joining me as a guest here on the podcast, Dan. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, this will be an inspiring, motivating message here in January, 2024. This is, this is my second podcast recording of the year too. So woohoo on that. Really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I just did one yesterday. I haven't done one in six months, so I'm, I'm jumping back in. Hopefully I didn't fill my plate too high on that, but, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope this is encouraging and inspiring. And I hope that the audience is willing to check you out. And may this provide you with more clients to help encourage and inspire. Fantastic. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you, Dan. Have a wonderful evening.